So thank you for a chance to present this talk. So my aim, the main aim for this presentation is to present you this formalism which is referred to as the topological recursion. And I'm not sure whether I may ask whether some of you have heard of that or not. Because it will help me. Okay, I see. All together or well, I mean, no, no, I mean to, together, topological recursion. I know you know of topology and about recursion relations, but about the particular recursion relations which are referred to as topological recursion. If not, then that's great because I have some, some job to do. And it has many applications as you will see, so just to somehow motivate it, and because the title of this conference is Applied Topology, I wanted to show a solution of one problem which has to do with some uh, what are the interactions which is motivated by biology, but this is just an example of how one can use this topology color recursion, and then there are many others which I will also mention. And as you may guess, this picture shows somehow schematic, schematically what this recursion is, but of course I will present in more detail later on what, what that means. So, just starting with this motivation, uh, I will come to that later on as well, but uh, to have it in mind, one could consider the following problem of bi biological complexity of RNA chains, namely of classification or just counting the number of non-equivalent in relevant sense uh, RNA structures which have a given number of chains, which is just a long, one long chain in this picture, and some number of base pairs. Base pairs are uh, certain combinations of hydrogen bond, which in this simple picture are represented by those red, if you can see that short uh, intervals. So one problem is how to count all of these uh, non-equivalent structures and this is somehow important for biologists as we will see this problem can be solved using this uh, recursion but this is just one of, uh, of the uh, problems one could use this recursion for. So uh, as I just said this is the motivation. This is also a difficult problem because it is known that predicting structures of RNA is NP-complete problem with pseudonauts, so this is why uh, this is not easy. But the same problem of classification or counting of the structure is related to the mathematical, mathematical problem of characterizing moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. So somehow the tools used in both of these problems are somehow the same and they have something to do with course diagrams you may uh, heard of, so somehow solving the first problem, at the same time we get to know something about the other one, which I hope makes it more interesting to mathematicians as, as well. And this topological recursion has something to do with random matrix theory, so I will just say a few words very briefly about uh, random matrix theory, uh, which, as you know, uh, is using probability, and in contrast to normal distribution, which we know very well, like the basic random matrix ensemble is so-called uh, Wigner's semicircle law, and uh, of course it looks a bit different. So uh, then the prob probability here is, uh, well, just as the name indicates, uh, it's according to the uh, semicircle shape. And uh, also, if you look at distributions of eigenvalues of random matrices, you immediately see by a naked eye that they are, in a sense, much nicer than of uh, just, let's say, ordinary random points. So on the right-hand side, we have random points on a circle, and here we have distribution of eigenvalues of some random matrix. You see that they are, well, they are also random, but somehow more uh, uh, nicely distributed and then they don't collide uh, that much and it turns out that in many processes such a distribution is a relevant one. And to say just a few words about the history of this random matrix uh, theory, it was devised uh, around, uh, well, in the 30s, in the last century. It was used in numerical analysis, Van von Neumann in particular. Then it was used to much extent by physicists in the analysis of uh, spectra of heavy atoms, in particular by Wigner, around 1960. And then it turned out it has a lot to do with uh, number theory, in particular distributions of zeros of the Riemann zeta function uh, can be described by uh, some random matrix uh, ensemble. 
And around 1990, it turned out that this random matrix uh, theory has uh, a lot to do with various physical problems like two-dimensional uh, gravity, string theory, and so on, and names like Witten, Konsevich appear in, uh, in that context. And also, this random matrix theory has applications in many other systems like high energy physics, statistical mechanics, combinatorics, graph theory, quantum chaos, quantum information, even financial markets, uh, neuroscience, and so on. So, in general, this is a very broad field. And this topological recursion I am going to talk about is just one, uh, one aspect of that. So, my aim now is to introduce this, this topological recursion and uh, I should also stress maybe from the beginning that it can be viewed from two different ways and one way is to look at it as some particular statement in the context of those uh, random matrices or matrix models as they are often referred to. But once you find the statement you can then treat it as a kind of a new axiom and formulate uh, it more, more abstractly. And this is also what I will do in this order. So first I will uh, introduce it or motivate uh, uh, from the viewpoint of matrix models and then we will uh, try to argue that you, one could forget about matrix models and treat it just as a uniform formalism. And when I talk about matrix models, what is important for me is the large and expansion of, uh, of a matrix integral. So first of all, I'm considering such an integral over Hermitian matrices. This M is Hermitian matrix. There is some uh, relevant measure, so that I'm interested in integrating over all of these matrices, of exponent of trace of some function called a potential, typically. This V of M can be just a polynomial, typically one considers a polynomial. And then this uh, H bar is just some parameter, here I integrate over matrices of some fixed size n, but I can also consider the limit when the size of those matrices uh, tends to infinity. And uh, then it turns out that such an expression has the following asymptotic expansion. So this is exponent of the sum over various contributions which are propor proportional to different powers of h bar. At a, given, at a given coefficient is denoted Fg, and this G stands for a genus of some surfaces which appear in the expansion of, uh, of this expression. So the way one could work with, or one could try to compute this integral in the way physicists do, namely deriving so-called Feynman diagrams. So this is a like, toy model for, for the Feynman diagrams. So these Feynman diagrams are uh, constructed as follows. You just look, if this is a potential of arbitrary degree, you construct uh, such uh, elements of the graphs. Uh, at, for example, cubic term, you have a cubic vertex, and then quartic term, you have quartic vertex, and so on. At the uh, Gaussian, I mean, at the quadratic term, you have so-called propagator. And then to compute this integral, you can draw all the diagrams which you are able to draw uh, using these uh, ingredients and then you assign some weight to each of these diagrams. And then it turns out that each of those diagrams, uh, if these ribbons have some definite length, each of these diagrams looks like a Riemann surface with boundaries and such Riemann surface with boundaries can be drawn on some closed Riemann surface of particular genus which can be found by the Euler relation. So this is the Euler relation, for example, if you have this graph, you have two vertices, one on the left, the other on the right. There are three edges, which are just these three uh, white edges. And then there are uh, boundaries by which, I mean, this one-dimensional red uh, closed curve. So on this left figure, there are three boundaries two inside and one the circle outside, so then if you compute what the genus is, you find that this is zero, and of course this is so because you can draw this diagram on a plane, this is planar diagram, or you can draw it just on the uh, surface of the sphere. But if you look on the right diagram, you have, just, you have also two vertices, three edges, but then if you look carefully, there is just one boundary, so you found that the genus in this case is one, which means that you can draw this diagram smoothly on the boundary of the torus, you can use your imagination a little just to try to see how you can draw that. 
And then the statement is that Feynman diagrams which correspond to a fixed genus of this boundary, to the genus G, contribute to a particular term Fg here, which is, prop well, it is coefficient at particular power of h bar. So for that reason, this expansion is called the, the asymptotic expansion. So this is how one can compute such, uh, such integral, which is also referred to just as the partition function. And then one can consider more general expectation values uh, in uh, such a matrix model. For example, such one, one takes a trace of the inverse of some fixed parameter xi, maybe I should have put uh, the identity matrix here, and then minus this matrix n I'm integrating over. And I could put such an expression under that matrix integral, this is what I mean by those uh, uh, charm brackets here. And more generally, I can take uh, a product of several such traces and also compute its, its expectation value, which is uh, an important object when one considers those random matrices. Namely, if one knows uh, all such expectation values, one can then write an expectation value by, by means of these expressions. And then this is also useful to expand each such expression in powers of h bar. Then one gets uh, a coefficients which are denoted w gn and then they depend on those n variables which I have here. And then it turns out that all this wgn, they, uh, they are not independent, but they satisfy certain uh, equations which are referred to as loop equations or word identities. And they are uh, the basis of this topological recursion I'm going to, to, to show. But let me just first uh, say a few more remarks. So first of all, it turns out that this WGM, they can be found from the knowledge of the so-called spectral curve, which is uh, asymptotic uh, distribution of eigenvalues uh, in the model. This is a certain algebraic curve, which is just, just a classical object. And then this topological recursion I'm going to present is a recursion relation which uh, expresses those uh, what identities between these uh, correlators W, G, N. And finally, if we know this W, G, N, we are also able to find this F, G. So one might uh, hope or one might like to compute uh, those F, G which are introduced here. They are quite important from, from this perspective and it turns out that computing W, G, N is a step towards uh, finding them. One could think of this Fg also as Wg with uh, n being zero. Yes, and this is a special case. So, before presenting this recursion relations, let me also uh, present you what the spectral curve is. And uh, as I just said, spectral curve is uh, somehow represents the distribution of eigenvalues. You can find it as follows. It turns out that this integral, if this is over Hermitian matrices, you can write in a diagonalized form, namely for uh, any potential v. It turns out that this integral over n square degrees of freedom you can replace just by integral over n eigenvalues of these matrices. And what is important is just dependence of the potential of these eigenvalues and all. Uh, non-diagonal terms in this matrix gives uh, give universal contribution which is referred to as the van der Mond determinant which is uh, this term. So instead of looking at this integral you can look at this integral over n eigenvalues and then you can think of them as you can think of this just uh, as of a system of n particles which are all uh, in this, which are in this potential force. So, in a sense, that they would like to uh, come to the minima of this potential. But on the other hand, this van der Mond determinant uh, provides uh, repelling interaction between various eigenvalues. So, on one hand, they would like to sit in the minima of this potential, but on the other hand, they repel each other. And when n goes to infinity, if you take the proper limit, you see that these eigenvalues are just located along continuous cuts uh, in, the, well, in the real axis, but then you can extend the system to the complex plane. So these cuts where this eigenvalue 
SID can be thought of as cuts that define certain Riemann surface and this Riemann surface is referred to as the spectral curve. And then you can also find the equation for the spectral curve. You can just put this van der Mond to this exponent and then treat this as an effective action. And then if you manipulate with these expressions a bit and then take the infinity limit, you find the expression for the spectral curve, which, uh, uh, which is an algebraic complex curve in two uh, variables x and y, which are complex. V is the potential which we had from the beginning, and then this R is some polynomial of orders lower than the degree or the order of V, which uh, but has some freedom to choose the, the number of filling fractions which are distributed between different minima, so this information is encoded in the coefficient of this function. So just to give some example, if you would consider the Gaussian model for which this potential is just the Gaussian, uh, just a quadratic function, then you can find that this, uh, this spectral curve take the, takes the following form. So y square term is just this y square. Then v prime, in this case v is m square, so v prime is uh, m or x in this case. So v prime square is just x square. And then this r, in this case, has to be a function which, uh, a polynomial which is of a degree lower than in fact, v prime, so this is just a constant in this case, which are denoted by 4t. And then density of eigenvalues takes the following form, which you can also find, just manipulating uh, these expressions. And this is precisely the semicircle law I mentioned in the very beginning. So this is how one can find uh, the spectral curve, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, from the spectral curve one can also deduce what those wgn so let me uh, show you how to do that. Now finding this WGN from the spectral curve is just this topological recursion procedure. And to find them, uh, first of all, we need to introduce some parameterization. So if, ha if we have that spectral curve, we have to parameterize it in the following form. We have to find branch points which are defined just by uh, dx being zero, like so in this picture on the horizontal axis we have x variable, on the vertical axis we have y variable, and then branch points are those ai's. And we also introduce conjugate points, so in the vicinity of each branch point for each point p on the curve we can find so-called conjugate p-bar, which is projected to the same x. And then also we have to introduce a few other ingredients, one of them is called Bergman kernel, which is a unique differential, double symmetric differential, uh, with the following uh, singularity where two arguments of this uh, collide. So in particular its form depends on the, just on the genus of, uh, of the spectral curve we are considering. If the spectral curve has genus zero, as in this Gaussian example, then this Bergman kernel is just this expression, and then for higher genera there are some corrections. So, for example, for elliptic curves of genus 1, this Bergman kernel uh, is given by some elliptic function. And then we need one more ingredient, which is called recursion kernel. This is just the following combination of uh, those ingredients I already introduced. So, Finally, I can now explain what this picture from the first slide means. So this is schematic representation of this recursion relation between various correlators, which is written, which is written in more detail uh, in this equation. So, well, it might look a bit complicated, but uh, looking at this picture hopefully helps a bit. So if you want to compute WG with index n plus 1, so namely wg with one additional point, which is denoted by p here. You have to consider two types of contributions. One contribution is this one, which is this first term here. So this is w corresponding to g being one lower, and then one additional insertion. <coughs> and one also has to consider all possible decomposition of those indices. There are n plus one 
uh, indices here and the set of n indices I denote by capital N here. So this capital P vector capital N means a set of points from P1 to, to Pn. So then I have to decompose this set of n points into all possible uh, subsets which consist of well, some subset J and then uh, the subset n and minus j and I have to take a product of two uh, correlators w with indices corresponding to those two, two different sets and at the same time I also have to consider the splitting of genus into all possible uh, pairs namely I consider some lower genus m and then g, g minus m so this is how this relation looks like Okay, so let me just uh, also mention that this FGs I had uh, in one of the first slides can be computed in this formalism as well. They can be found just from WG G1, just as given in this lower equation, at least for G greater than 2. F0 and F1 have to be, uh, have to be found by uh, some other means. And what is uh, important in this expression that I am computing, as you see, residues when Q goes to the branch point, so these are residues computed on, on the spectral curve. So what is somehow very uh, surprising here is that the spectral curve, it encodes a distribution of eigenvalues in n to infinity limit, which in principle is equivalent to the knowledge of F0 only, the leading term in this asymptotic expansion. But then it turns out that these two equations enable one to com compute in fact all Fg, which are all order corrections all in all powers of that h-bar uh, and somehow this dependence is universal for, for any potential so uh, by analogy to quantum mechanics this is uh, something like finding all possible corrections in something like WKB approximation just from the knowledge of classical uh, uh, classical uh, limit so that might seem very surprising, but somehow this shows uh, that there is some uh, big power in, in those matrix models. So, as I also mentioned earlier in this uh, motivation slide, uh, the formalism of matrix models, more or less in that sense, started to be analyzed around 1990 by people like Koncevich, Witten, Digraph, Berlinde, and so on, the whole Russian school. And uh, for many years people were trying to find this FG, but they were not quite able to. And then the breakthrough came around 2005, more or less. So this uh, topological recursion, which enables to find uh, FG, was found around 2006-2007 by Leonid Chekhov, Einarth, uh, and, and Oranten. So this is more than 15 years since people started uh, considering that, uh, that problem. Okay, uh, well, the pointer is gone, but I try to, uh, to uh, continue without that. Oh, the keyboard is working. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, discuss a few properties of this correlator WGN. They have some interesting mathematical uh, properties. So, first of all, they have some poles in those PIs, but these poles uh, appear to uh, be located only at the branch points. They are important in all arguments. This is not quite obvious. If you look at this recursion, you see that somehow this first point here in this recursion is distinguished, at least in this equation. So it is not obvious that they are symmetric, but it turns out that uh, they are. They are invariant under the first two of the transformations listed here. So you might think of all these transformations as symplectic transformations. This is how, this is how they are referred to sometimes. And uh, those WGN are not invariant under all of them, but FG are invariant under all these transformations. In other words, these transformations preserve this uh, dx wedge dy element uh, at least up to a sign. So for this reason, uh, this FG are also referred to as symplectic invariants associated to a given spectral curve. And then this FG commute with singular limits of the curve. If you have a family of curves, you can consider some limit where uh, you get some singular object at the end, and FG can be also defined for the singular object and compute in this limit. 
They are homogeneous uh, in the moduli. If you have a family of curves and, and so on, they have various interesting properties. So one is often just interested in computing this FGs or, uh, or WGN if one has some problem which uh, it is formulated in that uh, in that language. So just uh, well to summarize. I try to argue that one can compute this WGN and FG in matrix model formalism by some universal method. But what is also important, uh, and uh, this is in fact the statement of the second paper I listed uh, a moment ago by Einhardt and Oranten, what is important that one can in fact now forget about matrix models and just use uh, this uh, recursion relations I wrote as defining relations which are associated just to any algebraic curve or maybe not any but very wide class of algebraic curves which not necessarily have to be spectral curves of some matrix models. So one can just start with a plain algebraic curve equation as in the top and then using these relations one can define these objects. One can show that they satisfy these relations I showed in, in the previous slide and this FG can be regarded as symplectic invariants associated to, to those curves. So this change of view was also quite uh, important more or less uh, 10 years ago and then a lot of activities happened in, in that field. And what is important is that uh, this is not uh, only a nice mathematical construction but it also has a lot of applications in many um, uh, in many different contexts, in high energy physics as I just wrote here, of course in random matrix theory, but also in, uh, in other fields. And then there are various generalizations of this formal use. I will not discuss them uh, in what follows, but let me just mention that one can consider so-called beta-deformed uh, systems. So this is a slight modification of what I was discussing now, the difference is such that I put this additional exponent beta, which enables me to discuss other ensembles of matrices, for example, orthogonal, symplectic, or even yet more general. One can consider so-called multi-matrix models when one has integral over several ensembles of matrices, not, not just one ensemble. One can consider more general measures, not just uh, this Vandermann determinant, but other uh, Vandermann like expressions which might uh, appear here. So there are various generalizations which I'm not going to discuss, but if you are interested, uh, they are also useful in various contexts. So, what I presented by now is like a general setup, and now I'd like to uh, discuss some examples to show you the power of, uh, of all, all that. So here is a list of some examples, which are both more applied and more mathematical. One class is that uh, you can use this formalism to uh, find some uh, relations uh, or some properties uh, of various sets of uh, generalized uh, enumerative numbers, like Catalan numbers, Corvitz numbers, which appear in various enumerative problems, in case you are interested in that. The example I will discuss just in a moment is the example uh, motivated by those uh, RNA interactions I mentioned just in the very beginning. And at the same time, it is also related to moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces, in particular the uh, name of Penner, uh, Bob Penner, if you know him, is important here, who is one of the uh, like fathers of that discipline. This is also important in physical context, in particular in so-called topological string theory, and then surprisingly in knot theory and in many other, other systems. So I will not be able to discuss, of course, all these examples, but let me discuss in some more detail uh, this one example of RNA, intera RNA interactions, which uh, is also the topic of the paper I wrote with uh, Jorgen Andersen, Leonid Chekhov, Penner and Rydis uh, a few years ago. So the problem is as follows. We would like to classify all uh, those inequal, inequal and uh, RNA interactions I mentioned before. So we can think of uh, very 
simple model, like toy model of uh, RNA chain. So RNA, uh, in case you have never uh, worked with that, RNA is a long chain made of uh, nucleotides, and various of these nucleotides can be can interact with each other, which means then can, they can form hydrogen bonds. And so instead of considering this complicated chain, you might just uh, pull it by its end, so then the chain becomes an interval, and each of those hydrogen bonds become, becomes an arc like in those pictures here. And the question is how many non-equivalent uh, configurations of those arc you could draw. So here is some example, the, the simplest example, when you have just one backbone, namely just one chain. More generally, you could consider a system which consists of several chains. So then there would be several backbones, like in this example, here are two backbones. But for a moment, let me just focus on one backbone. And let me consider the case where none of these curves, none of those arcs intersect. So then we can compute by hand what the number of these configurations is, and we can write a generating function. If there is no chord, then of course there is just one configuration which is represented by this one. If then there is one chord, there is also one configuration, so this is one which is the efficient of this z. If there are two chords, we have these two in equivalent configurations, so this is two here. Then there are five configurations with three chords and so on. You can see that these numbers which we get here are just Catalan numbers and they appear in the expansion of the following function. And then I denoted by this function, I denoted by C01. This one means that I have one backbone, and zero uh, is equivalent to the fact that they don't intersect. In fact, it will have to do with genus zero uh, of some auxiliary surface I will mention in a moment. And I, as I will show in a moment, one can get uh, this function and more general functions for arbitrary number of backbones and genus from considering a matrix model of the type I discussed before with the following potential, which you could think of as Gaussian potential, but with some uh, non-obvious correction. So in fact this potential is not even a polynomial, but it has, if you expand in X, it has infinite number of, of terms. So I just showed you what is the, the simplest C0-1 term, but you could consider other terms. So you could consider terms where you have arbitrary number of backbones B. And then uh, you can somehow encode uh, the complexity of those crossing between arcs. It turns out that this complexity of those arcs can be translated to the genus of some surface. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't have a picture of that, but this is simple to uh, find. So if you have such a chord diagram, what you can do, you can replace each backbone and each of those arcs by a ribbon of some width. So then you get such a picture. And then you can think of this picture uh, similarly as of the Feynman diagram I had earlier. You can uh, relate it immediately to a young dog, uh, to Feynman diagram just by shrinking each of these backbones to, to a point a point or a small circle. So then you will get the pictures I, I had earlier and then you could draw each such a diagram with those white ribbons on a surface of some uh, particular genus and then this parameter G corresponds to genus of that surface. So then the question is what is generating function CGB for arbitrary number of backbones and genus? Like here you could also uh, write it as a series in Z, like in this example, and then you would ask what are those numbers of CGBN, which are the numbers of inequivalent cores for a given number of backbones, cords, and also genus. So that's the, the important question. Here we have one example, and then it turns out that to find this CGB is quite non trivial, but it can be found in this topological recursion formalism. So, again, this is this question, and uh, here you have some example of more real RNA chain and the corresponding chord diagram, so you can see that uh, they are getting quite complicated. Let me remind again that apart from this RNA interaction, those numbers uh, are also important from mathematical viewpoint, namely they 
tell you what is the number of cells in so-called cell decomposition of moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces with boundaries. So that's why mathematicians are also quite interested what, what they are and what are properties of, of that numbers. And uh, then, uh, as I said, you have to somehow believe me now because I would need much more time to give more details, but the statement is that to find this CGB, one can consider matrix model of the type I discussed uh, earlier with this potential, and then one has to compute FG, those free energies for that model, and a given uh, FG encodes all of this CGB for this fixed G which we have on the left hand side. And then you can also write this FG as a sum in various powers of S. So you see that this potential depends on two parameters, S and T. And one of them is a generating parameter for the number of backbones. This is S, which is why this S comes with the power of B here, where B corresponds to the number of backbones. And this T is the generating parameter for the number of, of uh, arcs or chords. So as you see here, those different Zs which we had here, they had the power which was the number of chords in this picture. For example, here we had three chords, that's why here was a term Z cube, and the coefficient was the number of those different terms, and uh, this is also what I mean here. Oops. So this S comes with the number, which in this case is the number of backbones, and then the argument of C is T square, and this T square comes with the power which is the number of chords. And then, so one can compute this FGs using this topological recursion for this potential. This is quite involved technically, but when one does this, one gets the following answer. So it might seem complicated, and uh, well, it's not obvious what this means, but it's very important that this is the exact answer which encodes all of this C for genus 2, and arbitrary number of backbones, and arbitrary number of uh, of those arcs or codes. Here are some parameters, uh, sigma, delta, and so on. I even didn't write their definition, but they are some combinations of S and T, and then you can expand these results in powers of S and T. Uh, well, you can also do that for higher uh, FGs, so this is F3, which is even more complicated, but again, this is finite answer, no approximation, just exact result for arbitrary C, GB, with uh, just G being free. So you can expand this results in powers of S and, uh, S and T, and then you find generating functions, some particular generating functions you might be interested in. So for example, C to 4 is given by this expression, and, and so on. These are some examples for 4 backbones, for 5 backbones, and so on. And of course, counting that by hand would be impossible, or even writing a computer code which would count all of these chords in different uh, ways, uh, at most would enable you to compute this CGB in some expansion up to maybe some number of chords, but uh, probably not, uh, you wouldn't get the uh, exact answer in that, uh, just in this form. So I hope that this shows somehow the power of the formalism and somehow I hope this is a bit surprising that some problem motivated by biology or at the same time by the modulized spaces of Riemann surfaces finds a solution from that random matrix formalism. So uh, this was one example. I can say a few words about another example which has to do well in physics terms with topological string theory and in mathematics term with computation of gromov witten invariants for so-called toric Calabi-Yau manifolds. So in this picture we have uh, examples or some schematic representations of certain toric free complex dimensional Calabi-Yau manifolds. You can think of them as manifolds which are glued, which are made of several C3 patches, which are glued in appropriate way. And each of these vertices in these pictures, like here, represents one C3 patch. So this figure on the left, you could forget now about, uh, well, you, could, you should focus for a moment just on those uh, heavy lines. So this vertex represents somehow the structure of C3. And then this picture uh, represents Calabi-Yau manifold, which is made of two C3 patches glued 
together. What is also important is that each of those heavy lines represents some circle which is uh, degenerating along such a line. So in particular if we have uh, several lines which end at one point, it means that one circle degenerates to a point uh, in each vertex. So here we have a situation where we, where we have one circle which is fibered over this interval and generates to point at two ends of this interval, which means that in fact uh, this represents uh, a sphere or uh, just P1, complex P1. And in fact this is uh, this manifold here is so-called resolved conifold, which is some line bundle over, over P1. And this is uh, some local version of uh, complex P2 uh, manifold. So these are certain toric manifolds that for which people working on mirror symmetry, for example, compute gram of Witten invariants, and it turns out that this gram of Witten invariants can also be found using this topological recursion formalism. Just very roughly, this gram of Witten invariants, or in physics language topological string amplitudes, they count colomorphic maps from some Riemann surface of fixed uh, genus and possibly number of punctures into some Calabiao freefolds, like of this time I of this type I just uh, discussed. And then uh, in mirror symmetry, one can consider so-called mirror Calabiaus, which for the historic Calabiaus turn out to be of the following form, they can be written just as certain, uh, by certain equation in C4 space, U, V, X, Y are complex coordinates in four-dimensional complex space, and then the claim is that such an equation defines some toric Calabiao freefold, which is mirror to one of those toric ones, if one chooses this polynomial A of X, Y in a relevant way. There is a way to, to do that. This A of X, Y is also referred to as the mirror curve. And then there is uh, a statement that you can find Grom of Witten invariants for these initial manifolds by considering topological recursion and computing WGN and this free energy FV associated just to these mirror curves. So this is a conjecture which was proposed by uh, Bouchard, Clem, uh, Paschetti and uh, Marino in 2009, and it also gave rise to a lot of activity. I will not uh, well discuss details, but this just shows you that this formalism has applications even in such exotic contexts. And that uh, then there is yet another uh, area where this. Uh, run, well, where this topological recursion has uh, nice uh, applications which has to do with quantization problems. This is something also I, I have been working on, in particular with Sergei Bukov. Uh, so this is a bit different type of problems. Namely, it turns out that in various cases algebraic curves happen to be so-called symbols or classical limits of certain differential or difference operators or Schrodinger-like operators, which are sometimes referred to as quantum curves. So in some problem one considers those differential or difference operators which acting on some object, you can think of this as wave function, just gives zero, and they have such a property that when uh, the parameter h-bar, which uh, for example defines commutation relations between this x hat and y hat. When this parameter goes to zero, then this a hat degenerates just to an algebraic curve, and then you can think of this a hat as quantum, in a sense, quantum version of that curve. And then topological recursion allows one to reconstruct this wave function psi from this WGNs I introduced earlier. And uh, in the second step, one can, if one knows the swing function, then one is able to reconstruct this A-hat. So in that sense, this topological recursion gives a way to uh, define in some uh, well-defined way those operators A-hat from the knowledge of, of those classical spectral curves. 
and it has quite surprising applications. For example, in knot theory, in knot theory, one considers objects which are called apolynomials, which uh, are some kind of invariants of the knots, and then there are also the quantum versions which impose some recursion relations between uh, so-called colored uh, Humphrey or Carl Jones polynomials. And then it turns out that those quantum A polynomials can be reconstructed using this topological recursion. So this is yet another field where this formalism turns out to have applications. So, uh, just in a few details how this works. So this wave function, it turns out that like universally it could be thought of as in matrix model context as something analogous to determinant of the following expectation values of uh, value of determinant of uh, x minus n. And this psi, also if you expand this determinant then it has the following asymptotic expansion in powers of h bar and then each of those terms as 0, as 1, as 2 and so on can be reproduced from those WGNs which are determined by, uh, by the topological recursion. So if one is able to reconstruct this ends, then doing some more work one is able to determine this, this a hat. And apart from this not theory context, it has also applications in, in, in some other contexts. So, well, because my time is slowly coming to an end, I will not discuss more examples or technical problems. I'd like just to mention that this uh, formalism has attracted a lot of attention and uh, there is a whole bunch of people working on these problems. Various conferences have been organized uh, where these issues were discussed by some prestigious institutions like the Banff Research Center or American Institute of Mathematics in last years. In particular, last year there was an important event organized by Math American Mathematical Society, so-called von Neumann Symp Symposium, which is very like prestigious uh, uh, event organized once in a few years, and then there is a lot of competition to be able to organize that. So that symposium last year was devoted to topology cover Carson and its influence in analysis, geometry, and uh, topology. And here is some abstract. Maybe I will not read that, but you, if you are interested, uh, you can look at the web page and uh, see which other topics were discussed uh, in that context. And then there are still uh, new important developments. This is a paper just from three months ago by Maxim Koncevich and Seibelman, where they introduced uh, some new perspective and much more abstract way of thinking about topological recursion. They introduced uh, some formalism that they refer to as A-ray structures, from which they are able also to deduce these topological recursion relations and discuss their uh, other properties which have not been uh, discussed so far. So there is a hope that this fit will be still developing in, in the coming years. So uh, to sum up, what I have discussed is this topological recursion. This gives all order solution to uh, matrix model integrals if one is working in the context of matrix models or more universally one can forget about matrix models and then think of this recursion as a, some tool which assigns to a given algebraic curve a set of interested invariants. It has applications in various problems, for example in the classifications of those RNA structures but also in many other fields like combinatorics, algebraic geometry, math theory, high energy physics, string theory and so on. So if you are interested in any of this, I would be happy to discuss it later on as well. Thank you. Any questions? Let us send the speaker again. Okay.